Welcome to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series, a digital program featuring fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. We have a double feature this week, bringing you Mary Howard, the program director at the Bio and Health Tech Entrepreneurship Lab in New York City, commonly known as eLab, and Dr. Joseph Basagagna, the founder and CEO of Landos Biopharma, which was an early eLab company. All right. It looks like we have a um, looks like we have a fairly critical mass. So we're going to go ahead and get started um, with our guest, Dr. Barbara Murphy, today. So thank you all. My name is Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I am the CEO at New York Bio. Um, we're thrilled to continue with our virtual breakfast series. And in a shameless plug, today I am drinking my coffee out of the Bio. Or that may be backwards for everybody. Um, the Bio Digital Coffee Mug. <laughs> So next week is the in place of the international convention um, that was going to take place in San Diego. Um, everyone will be dialing in all over the globe doing digital um, networking as well at networking meetings as well as learning sessions. So we hope you'll be able to join us and um, New York Bio is able to provide nine early stage companies with free access um, through our partnership with Bio. So we were able to provide um, partnering passes as well as access to nine early stage companies in New York. So that was great. Um, a couple of other things we have um, coming up, you'll see a newsletter from me later today. Uh, part of New York um, is entering phase two of the reopening plan. And as most of you know, um, that includes businesses. So office space will be reopening, um, not downstate yet. Um, but certainly some of our neighbors upstate, um, some of you on the phone are probably getting ready to go back into your offices over the next few days. Uh, we'll have guidance for you on that, as well as some other things that are coming up. And then addition, just look out, be on the lookout for, from us for more information on additional webinars we're gonna be doing over the summer, as well as our emerging company showcase that we're doing with the New York Stock Exchange. And finally, we will round out um, the summer slash entering fall with our annual meeting on September 14th. Um, Derek, I will turn it over to you to introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Barbara Murphy. Thanks. Morning, Barbara. You froze morning. there for a second. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, so good morning, and it's great to uh, it's great to have you here. Usually we start off with oh sorry. Am I freezing? Uh, you froze for a second. Uh, you're good now. Okay. Oh, so good morning. So we uh, I wanted to just uh, give you a little opportunity to to uh, talk a little bit about your your bio and where you came from, and we'll uh, and we'll get into uh, and and we'll get into the webinar. So I'm from Dublin. I went to med school in Dublin. Um, probably as some of you know, we go straight from high school into med school in Dublin. Uh, so I did med school. I did internship, two years of SHO, which is residency, and um, a year of registrar, which is fellowship in Dublin. So I actually started specializing in nephrology in Dublin um, at the National uh, Renal uh, Unit in uh, Beaumont in Dublin. And from there, I went to Boston, to Brigham and Women's, to the home of kidney transplant, uh, where I was a nephrology fellow um, and specialized in transplant immunology with uh, one of the giants of, of transplant called uh, Bernie Carpenter and also um, Mo Sayeg. Um, so, and you know, for those of you who may not know, uh, Brigham is the home of, it was the first kidney transplant was done at Brigham. Um, so it was an absolutely wonderful place to learn about transplant immunology. And from there, I was recruited to Mount Sinai as the uh, medical director for the kidney transplant program. And so I was there five years when I was made division chief um, and then uh, went on to be the dean for uh, that oversaw the, of what we call the CTSA, which is a very large grant for overseeing the infrastructure for clinical and translational research at Sinai. And then eight years ago, I was made um, chair uh, of the Department of Medicine. Within a year, we went through a very large merger. And so then I was put in charge of eight, uh, seven and then eight departments of medicine for the Mount Sinai healthcare system. Yeah, no, Mount Sinai is, has expanded all over the place yeah. in New York City in the last however long. Uh, you know, I live 
I live up by Columbia and uh, right by St. Luke's there. And literally within about five minutes of that merger going through, we had Mount Sinai banners all down our street. Uh, it was very, it was very clear that in Columbia territory, we were now in, we were now in Mount Sinai. It's now Mount Sinai morning side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think one of the, one of the best ways to, to open up this morning is, is to talk a little bit about uh, how Mount Sinai has dealt with, with COVID. Uh, and you sit in, in an exceptional position because you were the basically the chair of the uh, the response team, yeah. and you know it, within any of the centers in in New York, there we we hear all of all of these things. But one of the things that uh, I tweeted about the other day and, and that we discussed is you know you guys actually published uh, your your guidelines for how you developed your response team and and how you actually responded to uh, to the virus. So. I think this would be a, a really interesting way to start. And can you talk a little bit about the kind of the planning stages, right? Because it's it's you know in in reading the paper, there are a lot of things that that were, were crystal clear, and it it looks like you know wonderful, straightforward marching orders down the line. There's a lot to dig into, but I can imagine there was probably some chaos in in, in at least in setting it up, right? Was it how was how would the Not process so go chaos. right from the beginning? Like stunned initially, you know, when you look at the numbers. <laughs> No, I mean, the way most people described it was waiting for a tsunami, but just not knowing how big it was going to be. And would we get over it or would we get you know, squashed or would we get pummeled by it? And that was really what it felt. I mean, we were preparing it in a very methodical and thoughtful way. There was no panic. Um, uh, very clear uh, you know, messages coming, you know, be calm, be cool, be prepared, you know, and that was coming from the institution and from the department to the people in the department. But at the same time, there was this sense of foreboding because you just didn't know how bad it was. And so we started out, you know, very clearly with the ambulatory platform um, trying to, you know, scale to be able to do the testing, closing down routine visits, any routine visits were, and so we had three phases. We developed three phases for the outpatient practice, very clearly mapped them out, how to traffic COVID, non-COVID, keep them separate how to be able to scale that. And we knew that there would come a point where we would pivot from outpatient to inpatient. And um, I, you know, we did uh, some modeling to determine the numbers that we'd be looking at for each of the hospitals based on doubling time. And we were bang on. I, I, I mentioned the other day, right at uh, the beginning of March, I said to my, the head of my hospitalist program, within three weeks, we will have 750 people in Mount Sinai on the Upper East Side. And then I outlined all the numbers of patients at each of them. And I said this in vice chairs, and they're all like, no way, no, this can't be. And I'm like, I'm not showing you what the real modeling shows because the modeling at one point was showing because the doubling time was so uh, small uh, mm -hmm. and before social distancing. At one point it looked like our system would have 22,000 patients, just our system. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. And so that was, yes, yeah, so that was, I kind of ignored that and focused on yeah. something that I could manage, but understood that I would, you know, there would be other contingency plans that would have to go into place. And we actually planned for all of those contingencies, you know, where you'd have patients where, you know, everywhere, absolutely everywhere and anywhere. Um, and so we created a system where we rapidly, within three weeks, we were two weeks, we had pivoted to inpatient, that, which meant that outpatient was for emergencies only. And, for, uh, and we had a triage for COVID and non-COVID um, and everything else. That meant that we could then mobilize all of our doctors to be on the inpatient service. Yep. Um, when we started out, you know, we had a morph between our routine system and the response to COVID. And we had a mixture between COVID floors and non-COVID floors. So we just added teams on. So, and, and what we did was we looked at our divisions and we looked at other departments and we, you know, you know who you can call on immediately who are great doctors that you can put with um, PAs and they'll be able to run that service straight away. So we layered them on immediately. So creating, almost creating additional hospitalist teams. Mm -hmm. Then what we did was we started looking at every person we could get our hand on hands on understanding their capabilities and then we and, um, started layering in teams overseen by hospitalists and eventually we just pivoted one weekend we pivoted we changed the entire inpatient service because now we were completely COVID we 
changed, broke down our hospitals and our resident teams. Fellows became attendings because they're, they're really good. It's better than having an attending that's out for years. You have a fellow that was a recent graduate and we structured, restructured our entire inpatient service based on skills to make sure each team had the skills that they needed. And then on top of that, layered a hospitalist, an ID doc and a pulmonologist. And we created what we call geography, meaning that if you had 12 patients, they were in 12 rooms in a row, which means that you didn't have to take off your PPE, you just took off your gloves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we knew from China that when they did that, they reduced the nosocomial transmission of COVID to almost zero. Hmm. Um, so the doctors just, and, and the nice thing then was the nurses were paired with them. All the supports were paired with them. So you had this team for those 12 patients. And that, that happened pretty quickly, but it meant on one weekend, we had to move patients, we had to move teams, we had to do everything. And it was a huge undertaking but it made the, the next several weeks much easier, far less stressful for physicians who are on the floor doing things that they haven't done in years. And they had all the supports layered on them. And um, the nice thing that we've heard back from the physicians that are on the floor, instead of being terrified because they were, you know, they're outpatient docs who haven't been on the inpatient for years, they felt totally supported, they felt totally comfortable and they enjoyed the team and they felt that they had we were not only scaling, we were providing the best care to the patients. Yeah, that was one of the things that really struck me about this, where it, the, the, number of, the number of factors that were actually included in the design, straight down to who is on these teams, what does is, what is onboarding look like, you know, making sure that you had different people with different levels of experience so you weren't getting, so you didn't have people that were, that were either all green or all whatever, you had diversity within each of the teams which to me seems like an, an enormous, it, it, a really prescient uh, design feature. The other thing too was, and, and I'd like to just ask you a little bit more about this. It, it, it sounds like there was a point where you threw a switch and, ever, and you changed everything at once rather than kind of gradual iterative steps. It sounds like you had the big process designed and said, okay, we need to switch to this right now and you implemented all of it. So it hurt a little bit more in the beginning, but that meant that what, that was normal and you could go forward from there. Yeah, it was just, you, it was all a question of what percentage of your inpatient was COVID. Right. And okay. once you reach the yeah. point where everything was COVID, you could undo everything. Yeah. Barbara, how many days was it when you went from sort of normal, you know, normal status? I'm sure you were seeing some patients that maybe we didn't know were COVID, right, in February, to entirely COVID. Was it a matter of a few Three weeks? weeks? Yeah. Three weeks. I mean, we peaked first week in, in August. April, sorry. I can't feel um, like August. I'm planning <laughs> already. <laughs> Let's talk about um, data forecasting, shall we? Everybody <laughs> calm down. It's okay. Um, we peaked the first week in April. We had um, 2,300 patients in our system at that point. For, 700, for scale, how many 700, I had said 750 on the Upper East Side. We had 730. Yeah. We're bang that's, on. That's 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 pretty darn close. So just for, just for a sense of scale, how many patients are usually within the Mount Sinai system? Today I got the first email to say we are back to our normal structure, normal census, mm -hmm. and we have 168 patients on our service. Okay, right. So normal and so normal is 168, and at peak COVID you had 730. 730, and yep. you know the hospital of Brooklyn normally has on the medicine service 50. Yep. They had 300 and. Right. So then the other thing was we, we worked as a system. Right. So Queens and Brooklyn were getting hammered. Um, and we also have South Nassau, which they weren't getting as hammered as much, but they have less resources uh, for, for crit really critically ill patients. So we were moving people in to our system to access ECMO and other, you know, CDBH mm -hmm. and other uh, treatment modalities that they couldn't necessarily do. And also just to decamp because there were so many patients in the system. Yeah. And in their hospitals. Yeah, it sounds like it's it's funny, but I wanted to make I wanted to make sure that 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 point was there. I mean, when you talk about when you when you hear all of the numbers with with COVID, the number seven hundred fifty doesn't sound like a lot, but when you yeah. realize it's five times capacity, you know that kind of puts it yeah. into uh, into perspective a little bit more. Yeah. 
So one of the big things that, uh, that, that you've just now touched on uh, and I thought was, was a really big theme throughout was adaptability, yeah. right? You know, it's, it's, you, you weren't entirely sure what was coming, but you designed it well enough to uh, be able to pivot, to, to allow things to, uh, to change, whether it was things on the onboarding procedure. You know, they mentioned that, that someone had never actually pronounced a, uh, a patient, you know, dead within the, within the thing, which is a big, uh, a big thing to think about. So my big question is, is, you know, are there things within the COVID response that you think are going to be kind of lasting, you know, changes or, or things that you add into the way that you manage things in the hospital on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, are there, uh, are there, are there kind of things here that you take away that you think are going to stick around? We, uh, we've kept geography. Not the 12 rooms in a row, but mm -hmm. if a team's on a floor, a team's on a floor. We've kept that at all the sites. We had always wanted to do that, but it takes a lot to reorganize and do it. Mm -hmm. We had done it, we kept it, so we kept yeah. that. And that's better for the physicians are now not running all over the place. They're working with a set group of nurses. It creates a great team. So we've kept that. Um, and yeah. we've, you know, we've written this up in a different way, in a non-COVID specific way so that we can use this should there be any mass disaster that we need to suddenly pivot and, and change what we're doing. And that's for sure. Um, you know, um, the other thing is just making sure we have a very accurate, we have a huge number of faculty, things change. Making sure we have a very accurate list of every doc in the system and what their comfort level is for what level of care. Yep. Yeah, so almost like an assessment tool that you've got at the ready so that you can. Yep. Barbara, did you all have, did you all host, I guess you would say, volunteer um, healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, yeah. and hospitals? Yep, uh, we had uh, one, uh, Samaritan's Purse mm -hmm. at the, the field hospital, which was really impressive, really impressive in the park. They had an ICU, 10 bedded ICU in the park that was, uh, we, we also helped staff, but it was mainly them. They were incredibly organized. We had um, another group that we paid for to come in to oversee and look after. Um, so one of the things that you know, we're managing as well, the floors, the floors are for all the acute patients. Um, so when people are better, we, we weren't able to, so people that were not as acute, but not ready to go home, mm -hmm. we had Beth Israel Hospital downtown, which we had closed floors on. So we opened floors and we had convalescent patients there. Okay. The other thing that, um, uh, so we had, we brought in people to help look after them, but we also had, so part of our onboarding process for the department, we created a team that oversaw onboarding of doctors from Mount Sinai into our team-based structure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my vice chair for um, quality and clinical operations created an onboarding structure uh, for not just Department of Medicine, but beyond that, to onboard volunteers and locum doctors. So, you know, for, for ICU uh, anesthesiology, uh, there's a lot of anesthesiology available who could come in and work in ICUs. So we brought them in. And um, so lots of different people from around the country. We had some of our graduates come back from around the country and volunteer. Uh, which was really wonderful but we had incredible people from the, around the, the country who came and said i want to help and so we had to uh, credential them onboard them so the amazing thing is you know uh, we managed to you know break down these barriers that normally take weeks or whatever things would happen in days mm -hmm. even from the research perspective getting irb approvals for COVID studies mm -hmm. was incredibly rapid so anything that we needed done quickly it was all eyes on this and we, you know, we, we, the, the, um, the normal barriers that are there, uh, administrative barriers were gone. It was not that the oversight was gone, mm -hmm. uh, but things happened quickly and that was wonderful and made people realize what we could really do if you, if, you know, if we could do this all the time, really. And I think some of those sort of administrative changes will be kept as well. Um, Fortunately, we had just gone all digital, you know, our signing documents, um, onboarding documents, everything like that had all just gone digital. So that was perfect. You got to test the, test yeah. the system. <laughs> yeah. So. Yes. Yeah, so. 
Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, something tells me the level of patience for waiting another month for an IRB meeting is probably going to uh, decline in, in yeah. the future. Um, and, and you had mentioned this this the other day, which I think is important to note. So we hear all of we, we hear all of the news about people either wanting to donate PPE or 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 kind of trying to mobilize getting supplies to hospitals. And one of the things that, that you had said that I was really surprised at was that the number of those either responses or whatever that you got that were fake or, or were scams, which is really well, unfortunate. There were some that were, so we had a vetting process to make sure that they weren't scams. Yeah. Um, so we had been warned that there were scams, that there were masks coming out that weren't truly N95. So uh, clearly when we got a very large shipment, Mount Sinai made sure that they were real N95s. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we didn't get, you know, we, we, you know, there were a huge number of offers, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, but fortunately we never ran out of PPE and we always had enough, which is unlike some, some places. We were very fortunate. Yeah. Actually, what's interesting now, if you look at the percentage of people who are testing positive for antibody, healthcare workers, certainly in our institution, healthcare workers have a lower percentage positive, which is a good sign. It means that the PPE worked. Mm -hmm. And they worked correctly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which you would have. No, it's, yeah. I, have a, I have a friend that was repurposed from, uh, from R&D to, uh, to being and attending again at, at, at Sinai, and he was almost disappointed that he uh, that he did not test positive for uh, for antibodies two weeks ago. It's like antibody um, parties if you have your yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we have Barbara, a really good. I have one PPE question. So you mentioned the the potential fake. Did you all have to go outside your normal supply chain? And I asked that one because I believe because now we're in a situation where businesses and a lot of those people on the on the call today will be responsible for ordering at least masks and gloves, so limited PPE for their employees in order to return to the offices. Um, so I know there's a scramble over sort of lots of different, um, lots of different potential supply chains, but clearly if, if you're in office space, you're not, you're not normally in the supply chain. You order paper towels yep. and coffee, yep. not PPE. So we actually, uh, one of the chairs of our board um, with, um, through a collaboration, uh, had the jets plane fly to China to pick up PPE for us, yeah. which was a huge shipment that got us through this whole thing. So instead of um, sports uh, figures, it was full of boxes yeah. of PPE. Full of boxes of PPE. Okay. And, and you know, I think other healthcare systems had to do that. Yeah. And the, the issue then is, that's great if you're a healthcare system, you can do that. But smaller hospitals that are around the country uh, or in small rural areas just aren't able to do that. And they, they're not able to keep large inventories of PPE because they don't think they're ever going to need them. Yeah. So they're going to be in a very different situation or maybe in a very different situation. Thanks. So along the lines of the, uh, on, the, on the testing email, we actually have a, uh, we have a good question from the audience. So they said, you know, Mount Sinai has been at the forefront of antibody testing. And, uh, you know, she's very gracious in saying, you know, congratulations on all the work done by Dr. Kramer and Dr. Garcia Sastre and, and everyone else. You have an exceptional department uh, there. You know, she asked if, if that antibody testing is now, you know, broadly available to the New York City community. So can we talk a little bit about kind of testing and access and, you know, how Mount Sinai sits w within the community and, and, and how that happens for, for other people in New York? They're still saying that you just get testing if you're symptomatic, if for the actual PCR for COVID, that if you're symptomatic, you get tested. Okay. We are, for certain populations uh, of patients, we are testing even if they're, uh, we're being more cautious with them because they're in group settings. Mm -hmm. So dialysis patients, et cetera. Um, for the, um, uh, so if you are, if you are symptomatic in that, you can go to any healthcare system and get a, a test. Um, the uh, antibody is available at Sinai. Uh, a company has been formed to scale that. Um, the, it's FDA approved um, and they are looking, I believe, to get FDA approval for it being a quantitative based assay. Mm -hmm. A quantitative, it's an ELISA, which is different. So 
they're looking at um, it being a quantitative assay, which is important, which was what we've been using at, and that's how we've been able to, um, you know, uh, get titers on patients and identify who would be good donors for convalescent serum, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it. So the plan is that it will be scaled, um, but right now I think it's just at Sinai, I believe. How do you make sure that 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 test and, and the results is especially if it's one of the good ones stands out in the field of you know really the the hundred other tests you know of some may be high quality some may not but, you know, i mean i think they're even saying um that you, know, you can use some of the others and then go on to do this to see what the level of antibody is mm -hmm. um so um i think you know, i i think I think that the fact that it is quantitative makes it different. Mm -hmm. um, also, the data, initial data on sensitivity and specificity is quite different to other tests that are out there. Yeah. Um, so it's very highly, uh, sense, it's specific and sensitive. So. Yeah, that's good. And, and those, those data tend to go around the world pretty quickly. Uh, I yeah. remember you know, literally the, the day that, you know, there was a larger company that, that came out with, with their test and, and sent out the results. And, you know, the community very quickly said, you know, this is, this is pretty terrible. The amount of false positives and false negatives are going to be through the roof if that's the actual sensitivity and specificity that they're going to quote. So, you know, I mean, we, th we think a lot about what kind of the testing future is going to look like and, you know, making sure that, the data that's perpetuated is 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 strong and reliable i think is really really important yep um Great. so we had another we had a, we had an interesting question here somebody asked you know, do you feel that being european gave you a heightened sense of the acuteness of the <laughs> pandemic i don't know um <laughs> i don't know actually ireland's done a just ireland's did a tremendous job in responding just does it give ireland a plug uh leo Varadkar, who uh is the T shocker sort of the president, but in, actually he's in transition, um, has done a, a, a fabulous job um, of responding and they've done very well. Um, so I don't know if being European gave me why you think Europeans are. I, I, didn't, I didn't ask, I, I was, it was interesting enough and it was a question from the audience and I figured I would, I figured I would, I would give it the air to let them ask. That. I don't know. my. My wife is British and, and so we got, you know, kind of two different streams of information. I don't know that one was any better than the other one, but you're the guest and I thought I would well, ask you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I was looking, I, I look at different news sources, that's true. So actually one of the interesting things was, um, uh, I had said early on in the department, there's going to be a lot of renal failure. We need to get more dialysis equipment. We need to get more dialysis machines. You know, when speaking with our division chief for nephrology, Dr. He, he was like, okay, we can onboard a interventional nephrologist so we'd be able to do acute peritoneal dialysis. So we scaled um, the person over at dialysis when they said they'd bought double the amount. I said, we are going to need more. We need to get, in fact, we didn't wind up with loads. We just about made it through. Um, but we're the only institution that didn't run out of dialysis supplies. Yeah. And some of that was we were, I was paying attention to an Italian feed on yeah. COVID. And mm -hmm. I knew that, you know, from China, they were saying three to 9%. It turns out it was much higher in China. Mm -hmm. But the Italian uh, re, uh, nephrology feed uh, through actually a colleague of mine in China, who's Italian, who added me to it, I saw clearly that there was a much higher rate of acute renal failure than people were anticipating. And in fact, you know, um, it came as a shock to people in the state and people at the national level uh, that there was kidney failure involved at all. They had not prepared at all. They, they really didn't think that there was going to be. So from that perspective, being hooked into the dial, uh, the Italian network helped. So there you yeah, go. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, think the, I think the appreciation of comorbidity goes, goes up dramatically once people hit a... Uh, a real world experience and they genuinely understand those numbers. And in a lot of ways, people get focused on, you know, one element of, of data analysis and they're, they're thinking about the number of patients with, with COVID and perhaps pulmonary complications, but not everybody necessarily thinks about the other comorbidities that, that come yeah. along with something like this. 
Um, but it's, I, it's, I'm glad you actually transitioned a little bit to nephrology because there's a lot of, of parallels here in, you know, even the dialysis field where, you know, it has been, you know, pretty stayed and tried and true for, for quite some time. And, you know, does, does either something like this or, or just in general, does this give you a new way to look at how you think about uh, the patient experience on dialysis, how the hospital looks for new and better ways to, to think about caring for patients? Um, I'm not sure that this necessarily changes. Um, I think it does, it did bring attention at the national level, you know, the impact of kidney failure. I mean, and most, uh, the highest risk for development of acute kidney injury in COVID was chronic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly, the patients who were on dialysis, they, they didn't do as badly as we thought they would. They actually did pretty okay. Um, but it, you know, around, there was a lot of work done at a national level around cohorting pain. You know, you can't self-isolate if you're a dialysis patient. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, it, maybe it, you're right, it does make us again think to the idea of the importance of home dialysis. I mean, the new kidney, um, uh, Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, um, the executive order did emphasize the expansion of home modalities. Um, but it does, again, uh, it does heighten your awareness of the vulnerabilities of people who are on dialysis in center in the event of a, di a disaster. Um, you know, either it be an infectious disease disaster where they can't self-isolate or a physical disaster like Sandy where, you know, places are flooded, dialysis units are closed, uh, blackouts where, you know, there's no, uh, oh, there's lockdown of the city, uh, all those sorts of things, and they can't access the treatment that keeps them alive. Right. Um, so again, maybe we'll emphasize further the importance of us having patients be able to be autonomous and able to be able to care for themselves in their home as being an important uh, my achievement in the, in the real world. How wide is, is that availability in reality? So we have one of the largest home dialysis programs in the city. Um, it is not uh, very, um, even peritoneal dialysis for years in America was considered substandard. You know, the mortalities aren't as good as hemodialysis. It, well, it's not actually true. The mortality rates are equivalent. Um, the, it was amazing how when you changed reimbursement, it changed behaviors and all of a sudden peritoneal dialysis is an outstanding mode of dialysis. Um, yeah. So it's funny how people pivot towards finances, but um, it's on the increase. Um, it's on the increase, but the executive order is looking to get 80% of people on home dialysis. Now, I'm not sure that that's feasible, um, it, it, uh, but it's a laudable goal. And unless you make goals big, people don't move towards them. But, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of people it's just not suitable for. You need to have, uh, uh, it's something that you have to be careful not to disadvantage people socially also because you have to have the right home environment. You have to be able to have a separate space, a clean space. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a crowded one bedroom apartment with many mom, family members, these yes. sorts of things aren't feasible. So um, there's a lot of things to be considered if you put a goal of 80% for home dialysis. Yeah, the 80% uh, the has to fit into a feasible 80%. Yeah. So we have a uh, we have a couple of questions from uh, uh, David Sands, who I, I've known for a long time. These are actually really well educated questions. He asks if you could share the incidence of uh, acute kidney disease in in COVID patients at Sinai, and asking if there's been any kind of deep dive to confirm um, acute kidney disease uh, from pathology, yeah. and also was the uh, the KDIGO criteria used to evaluate the uh, the AKD cases. And so 46% AKI at Sinai. Yes. It was, uh, the, it, it, um, it was uh, for, for ICU, it was uh, around 50% uh, of patients who had AKI. Um, of those who went on, about 30 went on dialysis. Of those who went on dialysis, 80% stay on dialysis. So this is also the thing that's important about COVID. It is not only an acute disease, it is a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And so people are, we're winding up with, uh, so give you an idea, people who went into the unit, now this is 
moving on, but at one point, at the end of April, it, uh, people went to the CU, uh, ICUs, not, not the unit you know, because there was, everything was, 25% <laughs> um, died, 25% left, and 50% remained chronically ventilated. So a huge number of patients requiring tracheostomies, again now creating, moving people out of the ICU for acutely ill patients, moving patients over to floors that we were creating like LTAC units, so long-term acute care, mm -hmm. um, and slowly we're weaning, now we're getting success at weaning them off, off the uh, vents. But the, a lot of the patients that have gone on dialysis have not come off. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to pathology, the biopsies, you know, we, you know there's this overall, we, we were expecting to see lots of microthrombi uh, because there was this coagulopathy. Um, in fact, when you look at the biopsies in several reports from China, Europe, and our own reports from Sinai, it's mainly acute ATN, acute tubular necrosis, but it is not just uh, due to low blood pressure in an acute setting in the ATN that we would normally see. In fact, we, uh, there's a publication and we have submitted a publication in native kidneys and in transplant kidneys where you clearly see the virus in the tubules. So ACE2, which is the uh, and, and binding protein for um, COVID to enter the cell, is highly expressed in the proximal tubule and the podocyte. Actually, it's oh, a proximal tubule is second to lung. And so you're seeing virus in the kidney. Um, and do we use KDOGI guidelines for? No. <laughs> okay. No. The, the acute renal failure was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. They behaved like they had rhabdo, they had massively high K potassiums, massively high phosphates. I mean, CVVH was, I mean, we actually reached, our problem was we didn't have enough nurses because nurses got sick and nurses are, dialysis nurses are highly specialized. Mm -hmm. We only have so many. And so when you're dialyzing 180 patients uh, in, in on the Upper East Side and similar numbers, not as big, but very big at the other sites too, we just didn't have enough nurses. And we, we so we repurposed apheresis nurses. We tiered techs with nurses to be able to scale but we did have to like change things around to be able to get to dialyze everybody. But um, they, you could dialyze them and then within a few hours, the potassiums were back up. So it was really very unusual, very, really incredible catabolic states. And Barbara, the anticipation now is that these, the patients who have left or have somewhat, I guess you'd call them partially recovered if they're still on dialysis, they will be on dialysis long term, or do you know yet? We believe so. Mm -hmm. We have set up uh, a center of excellence for post COVID care mm -hmm. to manage the long term consequences because people weeks out still are on oxygen with uh, lung injury, still on dialysis, still with, even if they get off, if you don't, uh, a, acute kidney injury is a risk factor for long term chronic kidney disease. And particularly if your kidney function doesn't go back to normal. So we, we're going to follow out. We believe that they're going to be at risk for long-term kidney injury. Mm -hmm. um, heart, uh, cardiomyopathy, we have people still with um, abnormal cardiac function. Um, so definitely still um, evidence that there's long-term sequelae to this disease. So we're following patients out to because they still have a acute, they're still acutely ill, they're still not back to normal, and to right. manage them through that, and then to see what happens to these patients long-term. And are those some of the patients that you're sending to your step-down care, if you will? So some of the patients who are still on a vent or on dialysis have gone to the step-down care, yeah. But we're slowly getting them off, mm -hmm. slowly getting people off. It's taking a long time. Okay, so I think this is actually a good opportunity. We're talking a lot about uh, about kidney disease and, and data. And, and prior to COVID, a, a few years now, Sinai has a uh, a venture called Renalytics uh, AI that that attempted to or or is attempting to use a lot of this data to 
uh, improve uh, improve kidney function, improve our ability to understand, you know, how patients respond, who gets better, who doesn't get better. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of pulling that uh, that venture together and really kind of how it launched uh, out of Mount Sinai and, and where you see things going? So um, risk stratification and appropriate allocation, uh, identification of individuals at risk for progression of disease, appropriate uh, triage for different therapeutic interventions, um, for uh, identifying patients who are appropriately co-managed with primary care has been a, um, an interest of mine for a long time. And then two docs from the renal division, Steve Koka and Garishnad Karni, came to me and said, we have, to, you know, Garish is the data person, Steve is the biomarker person. They've both been working on trying to identify risk stratification for progression of chronic kidney disease. And they worked together, joined both of their data and developed um, a product uh, which is now called Kidney Intel X, where you use three biomarkers, um, all previously known independently to be associated with chronic kidney disease, uh, but not very high performing individually. But they joined the three of them together, combined with data uh, and developed an algorithm to identify individuals, at the moment just focusing on diabetic kidney disease. So patients with early diabetic kidney disease to be able to say, this person is a, a rapid progressor. So the problem in, in, in um, kidney disease is if you look at the number of patients in the United States with uh, you know, 40 million people with chronic kidney disease, 700,000 on dialysis, um, and you wonder why are they not in care? And half the time a primary care physician will say, well, you don't know what to do with them. I send them over, you send them back. They say the same for years. Um, and so it's very hard to develop a care plan for a patient when you don't know who's going to progress. You know, so we had this patient at one of our events who spoke about, as an ASN, American Society of Nephrology event, who spoke about having a creatinine of three and saying that she was told that she'd be on dialysis within a year. She had a fistula pay placed. She became depressed, lost her job, disengaged from care because she lost her health insurance. And she said, here I am five years later and my creatinine's three. Um, so, you know, we don't know who's going to progress. So you don't know how to, who to navigate for early referral, for uh, preparation for dialysis, who to, who to send for early referral to transplant, hopefully to avoid dialysis. But more importantly, even more proximal to that, who should be getting aggressive management of blood pressure, lipids, diabetes, started on an ACE inhibitor now with an SGLT2 inhibitor, and who can we actually prevent progressing? Um, and who should we target for intense treatment with an, uh, a nephrologist? And uh, the other patients have a plan outlined and are navigated back to the primary care. And um, they can be reassessed by the kidney intellects on a yearly basis and sent back if their parameters change. So it's really about appropriate triage, identification of people at risk, intense treatment for them to hopefully prevent them. Uh, again, and so because there's no way, as with many chronic diseases, there's no way that uh, the specialists can take care of everybody. So you have to right. figure out how do you co-manage with primary care? And I say the same in many other diseases, but this obviously I'm pretty passionate about because of, uh, because of kidney disease. So um, they had the idea, there was a connection with people in EKF diagnostics in Wales um, and between EKF and Mount Sinai, they spun out the kidney a, a company called uh, Renalytics, mm -hmm. um, the first product of which is Kidney Intel X. Um, they also, in the process, I work on um, genomics and kidney transplantation and have developed several assays for risk stratification within transplantation identify, and identification of individuals at risk for acute rejection. So you can triage and monitor and um, manage immunosuppression. So in the process, they, license, they purchased the licensing rights to those patents also. Um, and then we launched on the AIM Stock Exchange in November, 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so, and things have been going pretty well since. Yeah, that's, it's, it's great to see because really, I mean, the major things that you're talking about are there are some significant consequences for 
how each of these patients are managed and being able to figure out much more specifically who to focus on and try to avoid these these major consequences has immense outcomes for the patient yep. uh, has has huge implications for how they live their life what they focus on and really I, I don't know if it gives them control over what their kind of health destination is but at least it gives them a sense of where they sit and a better idea of of what their prospects are right so you you don't have someone that says you know this is this is where you're going to be in a year and five years later they're, they're still not there and yeah. like the patient you referenced before had some really significant consequences to that um you know i think we we keep seeing a lot of this and it's been one of the areas we keep coming back to with these webinars is you know how do we get smarter about the the data that patients uh the data that patients can live their lives by the data that we can make medical decisions with uh, and hopefully have all those things lead to better outcomes um so that's that's really that's good and, and the other nice thing is to see that uh that your group and other folks within sinai are still uh publishing on this we there's literally a uh there's a there's an ai paper uh you know out from covid patients on uh, diagnostic algorithms. There's another yeah. uh, specifically out on the uh, the AKI incidents within. Uh, yeah. So that's Garish, Garish, the yeah. guy for Realytics. So Garish actually, as well, you developed a and uh, Alex Charney and a, a group called NYCIT New York uh, COVID. I, I can't remember what the. Anyway, they, it doesn't matter what the name of it is. But it's a group within Sinai that um, came together from different, because there's a lot of data groups, a lot of genomics groups within Sinai. They came together to work together. And that was also the wonderful thing that we saw, a rapid response and everybody working together. But yep. So they developed an algorithm to identify individuals at risk for um, acute kidney injury. Um, now, Re Renalytics is actually going to do a study uh, to follow the patients post-COVID that had AKI to try and determine, can you identify those who will be at risk for CKD and ESRD long-term? Yeah. yeah, that's really important. Now you have kind of the longitudinal follow-up. And just as, as, a, uh, as a note to the audience, uh, after these webinars, uh, I post both via LinkedIn and Twitter, I post a series of, of links and other resources that we talk about during uh, the conversation. So the papers that I've mentioned, I'm going to post those. Uh, I will post something on the uh, on the data group from from Sinai, so uh, it takes the pressure off of you, uh, Barbara, to remember every single thing that uh, that we talked about live. And I'll I'll do some digging and I'll make sure these resources get post get posted. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so I think we can uh, we can you know kind of keep going a little bit. We talked also a little bit about uh, transplantation and immunology, and you know again it's another field that. Um, you know, I think has, I don't know about flown under the radar, but I think it's been seen as much more important now in terms of immunotherapies and everything else that's been uh, developed. You have this, this entire field of people that have, that have intimately known about the immune system for uh, many, many years and probably weren't terribly surprised about the, uh, the revolution in immunotherapy that, that came around highlighting the things that they've known for a long, long time. So, yep. you know, it, it's interesting to me to think about where and how, uh, you know, the, the transplant community, um, you know, kind of continues to fit into the overall spectrum of medicine and whether you see anything there uh, changing either within uh, lines of research or, or visibility of, of transplant research as a field. Yeah, I mean, transplant sort of got stuck because of its own success. Um, so, you know, the outcomes reached a point where about 8% have an acute rejection in the first year. Um, the one-year graft survivals were outstanding, 95% in kidney transplant. Um, and, but the long-term graft survival really has only changed a, a small, 10-year graft survival has changed a very, very small amount. We failed to impact that really. Um, but you know what gets reported and while you get judged is short-term survival. But the, and so the other, so the part of that then is when you go to do a clinical trial, it's very hard to power a study to be able to do better than the current standard of care. Right. So it's killed research, but um, in the area because no one wants to take the risk because the outcomes are so good, but that's the short term outcomes. The other thing is 
the side effect clearly there. So, and, but it's very hard to do a study where you're going to say this, this does better by virtue of the, of the uh, side effect profile. The one that's, that we haven't had a, a drug approved since Baladocept, and I can't remember how many years that is now, but it's, but it hasn't been adopted because it has a 10% acute rejection rate. Um, and people felt that that was unacceptable. Now, if you follow patients out, even the patients that have acute rejection still do better long-term because they don't develop, fibro they have less fibrosis. Right. But there's no ability to say who's going to get acute rejection. And, you know, so again, we have failed to do what cancer has done. What changed cancer was being able to stratify patients and say, this 5% of people with lung cancer are, need this medication because mm -hmm. of this mutation. If, if uh, BMS had had, bio, had samples banked and were able to go back and say, this 10% were different because of this reason, those people shouldn't have this drug, everyone else will be good, people would have used it. And so that's, that's the yeah. area of research that I'm focused on, which is, and I think that's, there's, a, there's um, a good bit of interest in that overall, is stratifying patients to be able to identify. I mean, we've moved in America where everybody, nearly everyone gets depletional induction therapy. So we get the highest level of, of immunosuppression. Yet we know from the 70s that 40% of people don't need it. So I always flip the graph around the other way and say, okay, you all point to the success over here, but what about the people over here that we're doing well, that we're now doing a disservice to because we're giving them too much immunosuppression? So I think what needs to happen in transplant is what happened in many diseases is what happened in cancer. And that's understand our patients better and not expect every therapy to suit everybody. We'll never get any new drugs in transplant if we expect them to uh, be the appropriate therapies for everybody. It's the same with the tolerance induction strategies. Yeah, I, I don't believe you're going to be able to induce tolerance in everybody. I think it's just, but we should be able to find some people. Um, so I really think it is about uh, immune phenotyping and risk stratification, and it's the only way we're going to move forward in, in transplantation. How often do you sequence people before, uh, before, you, before transplant or anything like that? Is there any way that either sequencing or any other screening is routine? Um, no. We do tissue typing. Yep. Um, and then the, you know, uh, Peter Nickerson from Winnipeg has stated that if you do applet mismatching, you can refine that a little bit better. Um, the, there's nothing that um, stratifies. I mean, why we stratify a patient is, did you have a previous transplant? Are you African-American? Do you have donor-specific antibodies? Are you a child? That's, that's the current strategy. And that's, that's it. And, huh? <laughs> and, and um, you know, from the study that I've done, the, the AUC for clinical indicators to stratify for risk or to predict risk for acute rejection after transplant is 0.56. Um, so we, we actually have a, I developed a baseline assay. It's published in, um, is it this one is, hang on. I can't remember which one, which paper it's, uh, which, where it is, if it's JCI Insights or, there's, um, or Jason. Um, anyway, I'll send it to you. So we have a baseline okay. assay that identifies individuals at risk for acute rejection following transplant um, and also correlates with long-term outcomes. And then we have an assay following transplant that um, identifies individuals with inflammation, subclinical inflammation, i.e. the renal function is normal, but we can identify that there's something going on in the kidney yeah. um, and then it's not actually normal. And again, that correlates with it long-term endpoints. Um, Barbara, we only ahead, have a Barbara. few. We have, and I'm, I'm taking, taking the five minute bell. We only have a few minutes. And we do have a few questions that I wanted um, to get us back to. We're going to flip back to um, COVID and Mount Sinai. Um, there's one here. There, it's actually a two part question, and I'm going to take the second part first. Um, um, Luke Rosen at Ovid wants to know if you're encountering pediatric multi system inflammatory um, syndrome and trend. If you all are seeing that in Mount Sinai as far as patient load. I believe they are. I'm not um, involved with pediatrics, but I believe they have seen some cases. But I don't know any of the specifics. Yeah. And then the second part of this question related to what we had talked about earlier with um, uh, equipment and supply 
and he wants to know if ven ventilator, um, we talked about PPE allocation, right? But specific equipment, ventilator and other specialized equipment was an issue. And if so, do you see a more accessible process for future or potential pandemics or emergencies? We, we did not have a problem with ventilators. Uh, we did not have a problem with ventilators. Um, we had uh, some of the people in the pulmonary division, and I believe anesthesia developed a, um, a mechanism to put, ventilate two people on the one, but with a valve so that you could have different pressures. You know, a lot of people had come up with ways to ventilate people on the one ventilator, um, but you have to have similar sized people and then you know they have to have the same pressures. And, but they managed to develop one where they had a valve so you could regulate pressures for in, individualizing them for the two people. We, we never needed to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So we were very lucky. Again, you know, a very large healthcare system, a lot of people involved in innovation and discovery and developing rapid things to help us deal with this. And also just the scale of being able to access resources and deploy that around the system and help all of the hospitals was incredibly important. Not something that, uh, you know, a standalone small hospital is going to be able to do. Right, and from a policy standpoint, what we saw the governor do and, you know, back probably six weeks ago now, was issue an, issue an executive order that would have allowed him or the state to take unused yeah. resources like that and move them to hospitals. Yeah. But I don't think they ended up having to do much of that because I think there was a lot of natural collaboration. There was a huge amount of nat nat uh, natural collaboration and also taking people in. I said we took people in from the smaller hospitals in our system. We took people in from different hospitals around. There was one hospital ran into trouble with their oxygen supply because the oxygen supply was so huge. When you consider normally of a, a certain number of people on oxygen, you now have a hospital where everyone is oxygen hungry. Yeah. Yes. And huge demand. And one hospital in the region went down and everybody helped. Yeah. Everybody helped. Incredible collaboration between the institutions, which is yep. wonderful. Yeah, I think that's, it's one of the things that, uh, probably isn't talked about enough, but certainly isn't lost on everybody in the community with the really just the amount that each hospital system stepped up and, and literally, you know, through everything that we've talked about here, it highlights just how integral Mount Sinai had been in, in all of the, in not only the acute response, but if you think about it, you're talking about how the data groups came together, how people are now going to follow uh, folks with, with kidney disease. These, these are all kind of lasting initiatives that, uh, like you said, in different hospital systems, it's, it's harder to do, but that shouldn't diminish the fact that you're taking the initiative to do it. Um, and you're kind of putting in the work because that's where this is, this is where medicine and innovation need to go. Um, and these are the things that are going to really impact patients for the future. That's true. So, you know, this is, it's, it's, you know, it's the reason we wanted to have you on. This has been wonderful. Uh, and, you know, we just wanted to thank you for, for everything that you and your team have done, both, both throughout the crisis and really in being a leader in, you know, innovation and collaboration and everything else that makes New York great. Thank you very much for having thank me. You. I get to work with just a phenomenal group of people. I can't emphasize that much, uh, uh, too much. Just a wonderful, wonderful group of people to see how they step forward, both the scientists and the clinicians the admin staff, everybody, to see how they step forward was, you know, terrifying and heartwarming at the same time. Well, I sign off every one of the, uh, every one of the emails that I've sent during, you know, this, this, uh, this webinar that has been launched, you know, in, in, the, in the wake of COVID with a big thank you to everybody on, on the front lines that is being patients. And, you know, I'd like you to extend that entire thank you to uh, to your team and to everybody that you work with. We we can't Thanks. tell you how much we appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Right. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.